Thank you very much. It's great to be back. I'm an elder junkie and I've done uh, most of the uh, last 24, I guess. I missed the first few, but uh, done most of them. And I, I, I think from point of view of the international uh, platform, this is the best hydro-metallurgical conference in the world. There's no doubt about that. And a, a few years ago, I was fortunate enough, Alan asked me to come along and he said, could you give us a bit of a rundown on the lithium industry? And of course, at that stage, there wasn't a lot happening. And I said, sure. And Alan said, that was so interesting. Next year, we're going to have a session on lithium. And it's just got bigger and bigger and bigger. So it's a credit to Elder that that's going on. And we're actually capturing all of the innovations that are occurring around the world at this very conference. And of course, Australia is, to a large extent, the centre of the lithium industry. We are the uh, world's largest lithium producer. And it comes from a very small number of sources, I might add. Uh, Lithium Australia uh, really has four business divisions. We've got raw materials, lithium chemicals, batteries, recycling. One of the things that we've done is tried to dovetail all the technology so they become continuous. And I think longer term, that will become a key to the cost driver in the industry. Uh, and it will be something that will enable the industry to get their costs lower and present batteries to the consumer at a lower price. At the moment, we see a market in which batteries have been decreasing in price for a long period of time. Uh, They've sort of bottomed out, and in recent uh, months, there have been some increases in delivery cost to the consumer. Uh, The reason behind that is there's an enormous amount of automation, but if you look at the supply chain, there are a lot of people that take a clip on the way through in terms of profit. You have the, uh, let's, let's take the hard rock supply chain, you've got the spodumene produ- producers, they have to make a, a profit out of the spodumene concentrate they sell. That goes on to a converter that has to make a profit out of the lithium chemical that he produces. That then goes on to a cathode powder producer who needs to make a profit. The cathode producer finally gets up, it gets to the battery uh, producer who also needs a profit and then it goes on to the consumer. There are about half a dozen stages there that take a fairly large clip out of the business on the way through. And while we have uh, a supply chain that is fragmented like that, we have very little opportunity to reduce the prices or the costs below what they are today. There are some ways around that. I will touch on them. But uh, really, uh, what I planned to address was uh, the innovations that are required to meet future demand. So I'll talk a little bit about the uh, supply chain, the supply and demand, uh, and what we might be able to do to fix some of those issues in that supply chain. But first of all, what do the analysts see? And this, to a large extent, does drive the industry and drive investment. And what they see at the moment is EVs not being taken up at the anticipated rate. Uh, That, to them, presents a bit of a problem. We see spodumene stocks rising in Australia, uh, not getting through to the converters at the moment. That looks like it's a problem. We see decreasing lithium prices another problem and the logical conclusion of that is this means there's a glut of concentrates, the sky is falling in, the price is going to go down and it's not going to recover. So that's the way an analyst sees it and what they do then is adjust their valuations of companies and commodities and they adjust them down. They're looking at the wrong frame of reference and I'm going to tell you why. So that conclusion that the analysts make couldn't be further from the truth. And demand is, in my view, and you'll hear a lot more about this today, I'm sure, demand is going to outstrip supply, providing we keep doing what we're doing today. Now, there are alternatives, but if we don't change anything, there's no doubt that demand is going to outstrip supply. So what are the drivers there? We've got... Uh, on a global basis, legislation to reduce pollution, pushing for the outlawing of internal combustion engines. And there's a, a sort of convergence around 2030 where you've got Europe, China's a little bit earlier, India uh, and other countries saying no more new internal combustion engines, uh, we've got to go electric. So if you do that by 2030, 
the number of new vehicles that you're going to have to replace is around about 50 million. So this, this is not market demand, this is legislation. This has to happen. Countries have already legislated to make sure that happens. So if you take the, the average quantity of lithium today that's in a lithium vehicle and you say, I've got to supply 50 million new ones, how much do I need in lithium carbonate equivalent? You need about three and a half million just to meet the legislative changes. Fact of the matter is everyone wants to buy a Tesla, so there's a huge con consumer demand as well. So this is not only legislation, there's consumer demand on top of that. So the worst case is by about 2030, we're going to have to find about three and a half million tonnes of lithium carbon carbonate equivalent, uh, which means the amount of output will have to increase 15 fold and we haven't even considered at this stage stationary storage. So we're talking big numbers, big numbers. And of course today, what do we produce? A bit over 200,000 tonnes. This is a quantum change, very big change, and it's really difficult to see how the industry is going to keep up with it. Sure, there are small speed humps in the system, and today the uh, constipated part of the supply chain of the converters in China. We're already seeing some of the things that I mentioned, vertical integration, getting rid of some of the uh, process steps, putting them all in one company. We're seeing the vertical integration starting to take place here in Western Australia where the spodumene producers are branching out. They're doing a bit more than just producing a concentrate. Today they're going through to hydroxide. What's the next step after that? Well, in our company we've gone right through to lithium batteries and we have taken mine waste through to lithium batteries. Uh, not only to prove a point, we uh, plan on doing that longer term. But if you look at those supply dynamics, as I mentioned today, 285 gigawatt hours of installed capacity going to... Uh, you know, the number of zeros on the end of this number is just in incredible. It's 1.5 terawatt hours in 10 years' time. Now, that 1.5 terawatt hours is a really interesting number in that that's what's required to meet those 50 million vehicles. So it's not overproduction, that just meets demand. So we, what, what, could, what you can see here happening longer term is the constipation in the supply chain moving from uh, initially spodumene production as it was a couple of years ago, you couldn't get enough of it. Uh, now there's enough of it and it's moved it up the supply chain so we've got a constraint with respect to lithium chemicals. Uh, then we'll move through to battery production, which will be the constraint unless we see more battery factories planned around the world and, and possibly better performance. It's worth looking at the performance of these things. And it's also worth looking at the supply of the end product into the marketplace. Um, if you take the Australian example, uh, Australian producers of consumer goods could sell as many lithium-ion cells as they could get their hands on. The reality is they can't get sufficient supply of good quality batteries on demand. The same applies to even Tesla, where they've got a gigafactory that has a capacity, design capacity, of 34 gigawatt hours, and they're currently producing 24. They've got an argument on with Panasonic saying we're not going to put any more money into this factory until it actually reaches design capacity. And Panasonic saying, well, you know, you've got to, get, got to go through a ramp up period. What they're looking at doing now to uh, get rid of that constraint is producing some of those cells in Japan. So you don't even get regular supply if you own your own gigafactory, let alone rely on someone in the middle of China where you go and order some cells today and they say, we'll deliver them in a month's time and in a month's time, uh, you find you haven't got them, you've got a real problem. So uh, there's, there's a lot needs to be done in the supply chain to meet the demands of the, the consumer and we will see, no doubt, further commitments to battery production as time goes by. But what this tells you is the frame of reference that has been used by the analysts is clearly incorrect. There is no glut. There might be stocks building up in, in certain places and some of those stocks are material that are... Uh, are off spec and it has no mark that there is no market for or, or limited market for uh, and some of it is a consequence of the uh, uh, constraints with conversion in China. So the frame of reference was incorrect and I think we will see a situation 
uh, longer term where demand will certainly outstrip supply. So if that's the case, where is the lithium going to come from? And just uh, recapping, we need a 15-fold increase, 15, 1, 5, over the next 10 years. Where's it going to come from? We're seeing an enormous amount of expansion in Australia. The expansion that we, we see here is going to come nowhere near it. Um, the Salars have become somewhat stagnant. Uh, Canadian deposits aren't coming on as, as quick as anticipated, so where is it going to come from? Let's have a quick look at the sources, and you'll see here the abundance of lithium uh, in various types of uh, sources around the world and, uh, to a larger extent, the uh, universe, because I put chondrites in there, which, of course, are the uh, carbonaceous meteorites that everyone uses as the benchmark for uh, the concentration of elements in the universe. Uh, we won't go and mine the chondrites, but it just gives you an idea of what the uh, universal abundance may be. But seawater, very low concentrations of 0.17. I'm not going to go into uh, a, a lot of what's being done to recover some of these materials. There is a written paper and you can have a look at it and get some references there. But uh, there have been a number of projects proposed in Korea and Japan that came very close to commercialisation, didn't quite make the grade but uh, they were using various techniques for the recovery of uh, lithium out of seawater. Oceanic crust, never going to be relatively low grades. Continental crust, because of the, the way the Earth recycles uh, with respect to plate tectonics and continually fractionates that crust, lithium builds up in certain parts of that, uh, and in particular, uh, the argillites, the, the clay-based sediments, that ultimately get metamorphosed and become the uh, continental crust. So you can see there that argillites have uh, a fairly high background. Oil field brines, a lot of people have had a shot at those and again, uh, so far, not successful. What you need with these things, of course, is improved processing technology to recover the material from those low grades. So I'm not saying uh, one will never see production from oil field brines. In fact, I'm sure it'll come at some stage, but we need uh, a major change in technology to give that a commercial effect. Uh, the Grisons, which you, you're starting to get into really high lithium numbers now, and the Grisons are, uh, to a large extent, uh, the altered granites that sit in uh, many of the base metal provinces. They're the, the granites that contain granites or altered vein systems, as the case may be, that contain an enormous amount of uh, um, high volatile magmatic fluid things like uh, uh, boron, fluorine, lithium, phosphorus, uh, and the incompatible elements of stuff that's got uh, really big uh, uh, atomic diameters, things like uranium and thorium. So all, all these things tend to accumulate in the last stages of magmatic fluids. And if you're lucky enough to have one of these things go solid near surface, you capture all of that material in uh, an altered granite in the... Uh, uh, the top part of the granite as, as a grison. Uh, interestingly, they're, they're not all that uncommon and uh, the tectonic environment is one that's very easily identified. And we see uh, certainly one of the world's largest lithium deposits, Sinovich in the Czech Republic, being one of those. Uh, we have uh, one which uh, uh, we have our maiden resource on, which is the same, part of the same complex as Sinovich, but it's uh, on the German side of the border. At, and there's a whole suite of those that uh, run through uh, Western Europe into France, uh, across into the UK where you've got the, the old tin mines and copper mines in Cornwall, all, all start part of the same system. Run, runs into Ireland, does a U-turn back through Spain and Portugal. So these things are common. Um, they're relatively low grade but very, very high tonnages uh, and I'm a firm believer that they will longer term become a significant lithium source. Then we've got the lithium clays, a lot of work being done in Mexico. Uh, there's Bacanora, of course, uh, talking about future production. Lithium Australia has the northern extent of those clay deposits that Bacanora has, and we have the southern extent. So we're, we're locked into that, and uh, uh, I've got to say they're difficult, but uh, it's going to be interesting to see what comes out of that. And then we've got the more conventional sources, the pegmatites, and uh, the highest grade of all 
the batteries that we throw away. Now we spend an enormous amount of energy and an enormous amount of cost putting these things into little canisters and then we throw them away. So what we've got to do is discipline the wasteful society. We've got to change people's views on how these things happen. And if we go back to the, uh, the list of those uh, abundances, uh, the exotic is always tantalising, but can you actually do it? What you need to do is concentrate on the low-hanging fruit, and low-hanging fruit is the stuff with the highest grade because it's always going to be a little bit easier if you've got grade. Grade is king. So we have to improve resource utilisation because we do only get one shot at it, and at the moment the industry as a whole is incredibly inefficient, and I'll talk about that a little bit further. We've got uh, to eliminate waste and if you take uh, the world as a whole the uh, recycling rate on lithium ion batteries at the moment is about nine percent and uh, I congratulate all the Australians. I'll, I'll uh, uh, congratulate the Europeans first because they're about the best at it and I'll congratulate the Australians for setting a new global record and getting it down as low as two and a half percent. We are the most wasteful society on the planet. Uh, and I, I'm wearing a red tie, but that wasn't Labor policy, by the way. That's, that's, that's my view of the lithium industry and a few others as well. Uh, and we can also reduce consumption of lithium that goes into the batteries by better battery design. But I think let, let's have a look at the first part of the low-hanging ha fruit, and I call it the recovery dilemma, and really it's poor resource utilisation. And there's more lithium today discharge into waste streams around the world that never gets into the supply chain and we can't afford to do that. It comes from a wide range of industries, tin, tantalum, tungsten, processing clays, but not surprisingly, uh, one of the big offenders of the lithium producers themselves and as a consequence of the way the industry has evolved and has used technology that's been in place for a long period of time. That technology, of course, is bulletproof. They know it works, but it requires products of a certain specification. And as a consequence of that, we see uh, with spodumene producers between uh, recoveries between 50 and 70 per cent. Now, what's the nature of the other material that contains lithium that ends up in the tailings dams? Uh, a lot of fine spodumene that you can't make a commercial product out of at the moment, uh, and the lesser lithium minerals, the, the micas, the tourmalines. Uh, in the case of green bushes, of course, the holmquistite, my favourite lithium mineral. Um, can anyone spell that? No. Anyway, there are a lot of lithium minerals. They, they end up in tails, but there should be ways of uh, recovering those things. And then if you go to the brines, leakage is one of the big problems. That coupled with the residence time, in many cases, pumped into unlined ponds, and a lot of it goes straight back to where it came from, the aquifer that they pumped out of in the first place. So the recovery across the board is, is, is pretty low. And I mentioned uh, the very, very poor uh, recovery of lithium-ion batteries. And these things... Yeah, people get worried about uh, sustainable supply of cobalt. I know I'm at a lithium conference, but I can't help myself. I've got to mention cobalt. Uh, and that it comes from uh, areas that uh, uh, are controlled by warlords and child labour, and it goes on and on and on. And then we produce this little product that's 30% by mass cobalt. Uh, we use it for a couple of years and throw it away. And so what we're doing is uh, creating new ore bodies in... Uh, mun municipal waste dumps. So that's where it's all going at the moment. So some of these things, the, the way of getting over the hurdle is changing the processing technologies. Uh, I'll tell you what we've been doing to do that. We are focusing on waste material, mine waste, lithium micas, uh, the fine spodumenes. Uh, I believe you need to design with, uh, with purpose in mind. You need to suit your product to the market and to the demand, not just repeat what's been done in the past, and that's most important. So we've developed two processing, primary processing technologies, Silech for the recovery of lithium out of mica, and Lena for the recovery of lithium uh, from fine spodumene, uh, petalite and other similar minerals. So 
that gets rid of a, a, a couple of the uh, uh, wasteful areas of the supply chain. Um, and also what it does as a consequence of trying to get this right, and I make the point that we, we need to do these things by design, not by convention, uh, in an effort to get these things right, we found we had massive water balance problems in uh, firstly the silage process, and we required a lot of evaporators and crystallizers, and that was going to cost a bundle in terms of both capital an operating cost, and we had to find a way of getting around that. Now, the, the problem that we had struck was we were governed by convention. We were looking at a carbonate precipitation back end because that's what people do and that's what you can sell. But from a metallurgical processing point of view, is it the best thing to do? And the answer is no. And the reason behind that is you get large recirculating loads if you, you go for the carbonate or hydroxide, and it's because of the solubility of uh, lithium uh, carbonate at uh, high pH. So you've got large recirculating loads and you have a lot of trouble getting it uh, out of solution. So you've got uh, solubilities up around four grams a litre. If you go to a phosphate back end and uh, precipitate lithium phosphate, you've got uh, solubilities down around 20, 40, something like ppm. Uh, very, very low level. So you can get the whole lot out first pass and you can actually yeah, discharge your water and you don't need the evaporators and the crystallisers. The issue then is, is there a market for it? And the answer is there certainly is a market and there's a way of going direct from that uh, uh, process stream from either silage or Lena straight through to lithium-ion batteries. Not only that, the uh, type of processing technology does provide potential for the direct precipitation from brines. And if you can achieve that, of course, you get rid of one of the major losses in that system, and that is leaving the solution sitting around for a couple of years and leakage out of the bottom of your ponds. So taking that uh, uh, phosphate, which is something that we uh, really love, we've got a, a battery uh, cathode powder plant in Brisbane uh, that we purchased some time ago, and we're making uh, what I believe to be some of the uh, most advanced cathode powders in the world. But if you take that uh, uh, lithium phosphate material, without converting to a hydroxide or a carbonate, you can go straight through to um, lithium ion batteries, lithium ion phosphate, in fact. And we have done that. We've taken mine waste from Kalgoorlie. We've taken it through the silage process. We've precipitated the phosphate. We haven't even refined it and we've made batteries and they perform just about as well as anything else. Leaves you with a bit of a problem quoting a quality control spec to anyone because you don't know what you're going to get. The fact of the matter is the batteries work okay, but uh, from batch to batch, of course, the material will be different because the uh, impurities will be different. But it was interesting when I, I sent the first batch that came out of uh, Ansto from the silage process and I said to our guys, just send it up to Brisbane, run it through the, the plant and make some batteries oh, no, 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 we've got to refine. I said, I don't care what you want to do. Send it to Brisbane and make some batteries and let's test them and see what happens. Well, the stuff went up to Brisbane and one of the boffins got hold of the, the analysis and you know, it was about 5% uh, short on uh, full purity. And he looked at it and he said, gee, this might just work. Every one of these impurities is something that someone around the world adds to a cathode powder to improve the performance. So we put it in and we got better performance and we got producing batteries out of lithium hydroxide and we didn't even refine the stuff. Uh, so one wonders what people actually need to make these batteries, but as I say, every batch will have a different uh, ratio of impurity. So we have developed, in conjunction with Ansto, a fantastic uh, refining process, which is dirt cheap and incredibly simple. So we will be able to pr produce. And we, we have, incidentally, uh, produced batteries out of it, and that, that does give you additional performance in any case. So uh, that's, that's what happens when you add silage to uh, VSPC, the cathode powder technology. What happens with the uh, spodumene fines? Well, conventional converters require a relatively coarse product, which is a consequence of doing what they do. Um, but Lena, which is a caustic digest, actually requires a fine product. So that is the opportunity of adding this to the technology that's all already in place and taking the fine material that would otherwise go to the tailings dam and convert that to lithium chemicals. 
Uh, we can do carbonate and we can do hydroxide, of course. Uh, we would prefer to do phosphate because it's a much better way to go. So what is this opportunity if you could actually capture this uh, and look at the projected production of spodumene in Western Australia over the next few years, uh, that spodumene concentrate, the quantity export, exported, will probably rise to about 5 million tonnes per annum. That means on the current recovery rates that we see, about 2 to 3 million tonnes will be discharged to tailing as off-spec or fine product. Um, Lena will handle both off-spec and fine product. So there's the potential there for the industry as a whole to change their processing philosophies and improve their recoveries and instead of getting 50% or 70% or 75, uh, get up to high 80s or 90s. Then what do we do with the batteries uh, once they're gone? Uh, globally, they go into furnaces uh, where the lithium goes up the flue or into flux, you don't get the lithium. People focus on the cobalt. I've mentioned the number of 9%, we all know about that. Uh, we can see the focus that people have got going for cobalt. It's the largest part of the value in the uh, lithium ion battery and no one worries that much about the lithium. I, I have a philosophy that if you're going to reprocess these things, uh, it behoves us all to get the maximum value out of it. You should be taking all of those metals. You shouldn't be uh, letting things go into the waste stream. So we've been developing processes that will do that, hydromet processes that will recover all of those metals. So to advance that, we've bought 10% uh, uh, initially, expanding to 18% of uh, a company in Melbourne, recycling company. We're developing strategic partnerships with uh, recyclers in Korea and the United States. And part of this, I might add, is, is not just uh, about the processing. A lot of it's about the logistics required to collect the batteries. I gave a presentation in London in November uh, about the technology we were using and a little Japanese guy ran up to me and said, this is fabulous. We've been doing all the same things and we've got all the same results. Not surprising, you know, this, this is not rocket science. In fact, it's a lot like lateritic nickel. It's the same suite of metals. So not rocket science. We should all know how to do it. He said, so we've, we've uh, solved all these things. What we haven't figured out is how you collect the batteries. That's the key. So we're working on that and we will be expanding a number of uh, collection stations in Australia very shortly from hundreds to thousands. Um, so, yeah, that'll be part of... Uh, establishing a national network to collect those things. And then having collected them, we can take the lithium out, take it out as a, a phosphate, refine that phosphate if necessary, if not necessary, run it straight through to VSPC, rebirth the cathodes. I think uh, longer term it would be marvellous if we could just do that all in solution, dissolve the stuff, tweak the solution up to the right concentration and just precipitate a cathode powder because that's what VSPC does. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of the complicated thermal steps that most of the Chinese are doing. What we do is uh, uh, mix up a solution in the right uh, stoichiometric ratios, the LFP ratios. Uh, we hit it with a surfactant, drop out uh, a flock, spray dry it and uh, heat treat it and that's it. So the thing that controls the particle size and the chemistry in fact is that very first stage in solution. So you can imagine yourself further down the track digesting a lithium ion battery, getting those materials in solution, tweaking it up to the right ratio and just precipitating a cathode powder. No carbonate, no, uh, uh, no hydroxide. Uh, if you do have to precipitate, of course, go the uh, phosphate route. Uh, putting these things together, we believe, will give us first mover advantage in Australia in the, uh, uh, the recycling sector. So watch, what's the solution for Australia? What we've got to do is have superior resource utilisation. We've got to recover those uh, fine materials. We've got to exploit the micas that are available, clays if necessary, and brines. We've got to reduce the leakage. We've got to reduce the burden on critical metals and to some extent I'm getting a little bit outside lithium fields saying this, but uh, uh, nice to remove nickel and cobalt, uh, reduce the lithium concentration, improve the anode performance and design the batteries for longevity. At the moment, lithium ion batteries are a pretty short term commodity, but you can achieve all of those aims by going to 
uh, lithium ion phosphate batteries that have no, no nickel, no cobalt. They have a design life that's about three times as long as NCM and NCA. They're cheaper to produce. And what we could actually do if we swapped over to lithium ion phosphate, no, I've got to say lithium ion phosphate uh, was the first patent ever granted to John B. Goodenough, the grandfather of the lithium ion battery. Um, and it is still 25% of the, or thereabouts of the global market, mainly in China. So it's not an unknown commodity. Uh, and if we swapped over and said we've got a design life that's uh, several times as long and only got half the amount of nickel, we could reduce nickel requirements by 75%, nickel, sorry, lithium requirements by 75%. So the solution is superior utilisation. Oh, we've been through this. My apologies. So in conclusion, uh, everyone suffers from RAIN's anxiety and that's what's driven the batteries to the chemistry we see today, the NMC and the NCA. You don't have range anxiety when your batteries are fully charged. You only have range anxiety when they're going towards empty. So the phenomenon is not the battery, it's the person that's got the battery. So my view is to get rid of the range anxiety, we should be giving everyone 600 milligrams of lithium carbonate three times a day after meals. No range anxiety. Go for the low hanging fruit, improve resource utilisation, get the recycling moving, create a longer life battery and improve the battery chemistry. That's what we all have to do. And there are the people here in the room to achieve just that. Thank you. I think we've got a couple of minutes for questions, so I'll be happy to take some if That's time's right, yeah. available. There are a few minutes for questions. Please come out for the question. <laughs> Please, if you have got any questions, there are a couple of minutes. Okay. Do you want me to present a few more facts that you could ask questions? Uh, Adrian, I've got a question. Yes. You mentioned that uh, impurities in the batteries that can improve the performance. That's very interesting. So people are putting so much money to purify a lot of uh, 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 elements like cobalt, nickel, and manganese, and all those things from the nickel um, um, NMC batteries. If it can accommodate some impurities, then those extra costs will be reduced significantly. You, you would think so. There's, there's, there's no doubt that uh, impurity levels in NCA and NCM uh, chemistries are fairly critical. Uh, we've obviously proved that it's not quite so critical in lithium ion phosphate. What, what I m might say uh, that I, I didn't mention is lithium ion phosphate batteries will operate at high temperature. They will charge and discharge very quickly. You can fire a 50 calibre round through them, they don't catch on fire. Your electrolyte chemistry is a little bit different. Uh, so they're incredibly safe. They've got a longer life and they've got uh, uh, a cheaper, cheaper production cost. So you, you've got, got to say, what's the downside? The downside is energy density and the energy density is about 20% less than NCM. So hence the, the range anxiety. Uh, but I think even uh, lithium ion phosphate will change. If you, you whack in a couple of other divalent uh, ions and uh, manganese is the easiest one to do, you can actually get the voltage of the battery up. The difference is the, the voltage. You can get the voltage of the battery up to about the same as NCM. So I, I think uh, lithium ion phosphate with the addition of uh, some other transition metals, they may, may well be nickel, but uh, certainly it works with manganese and we've done it with manganese. So we can get the performance up to the right levels regardless and still have all those other advantages. I think in the Australian environment where a lot of the market, we are the biggest market incidentally for domestic power storage in the world, and I'm not talking by capita, I'm talking in absolute value, bigger than China and bigger than the United States. So there's a big market here. One of the issues you have with power storage in, in Australia causes high ambient temperatures. And uh, NCM batteries don't like operating over 40 and, uh, 50 is not uncommon if you, you're going up north. Uh, lithium ion phosphate battery is not a problem. Okay, thank you, Adrian. And uh, we have, uh, we're in the right time. Um, thank you for, I've got a question. Okay, very quickly. Yeah, Saikut Sengupta, uh, Wood McKenzie. 
One of the limiting factors of uh, energy, getting sort of energy out of N NMC and NCA batteries is the percentage of lithium ions that can be intercalated and that can shuttle back and forth. It's about 50 to 58% for LCO and for NMC. What's the corresponding number for LFP, if, if you would know? It's 100%. You can move the whole lot of them. And that's, that's why I say you can actually reduce the amount of uh, lithium by going from uh, NMC to LFP because you can transfer the same number of uh, lithium ions from uh, a, a smaller volume of material. So you can actually get better efficiency in the, the LFP and you can reduce the amount of lithium per unit volume. So uh, with NMC, you've got about 7% lithium or thereabouts uh, in most of the compositions. With LFP, you've only got four and you're still capable of transferring the same amount of lithium. Thanks. Uh, there will be no more questions. You can uh, catch up Adrian um, during tree breaks or other breaks. Please uh, give a big thank to Adrian for his presentation.